Hi, Jan. David? Jan? <laughs> So there'll be a few more people joining us uh, over the next few minutes. How many do we have registered? Um, I didn't check. I think there were uh, 14, 14 or 15. Good group. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Jen. Uh, there are two files you'll see on the bottom left of your screen, Mergers and More, and Steps on a Journey. Uh, you can download those by clicking on them. And uh, we will be looking at, uh, I think, at least one of those. Or it might be helpful to have both of them. Uh, so if you want to uh, download those and maybe open them on your uh, desktop somewhere so you can reference them easily. I hear the bells. <laughs> oh, you're hearing my chimes. <laughs> Class. It is the, the hour. My hobby is that I collect and make uh, clocks. So at, really? at any given time, you can hear a lot of chiming and bells going off around the house. I turned them down or off or closed the door. OK. Well, it's just. 12 o'clock and uh, welcome to uh, this webinar, Church Mergers and More. Um, you'll see on the top left of your screen there is a, a chat box and on the bottom of that um, uh, you'll see a place where you can enter uh, questions or comments to uh, participate in the conversation. And feel free to, we'll be stopping periodically through at natural breaks in the presentation to take questions. Uh, but feel free to put them in at any time, and I'll be watching for those to uh, bring them back when, when we have a moment to engage a, a little bit. Um, Cynthia is asking, will the PowerPoint also be available? Uh, Tom, is that? Um, um, I regret to say the PowerPoint will not be available um, simply because of many of the images that are uh, copyrighted, and I can't duplicate and send them out. Um, however, mm -hmm. I can uh, send a kind of a um, toned down uh, version of the PowerPoints with a blank, you know, a blank background and that sort of thing. And if you're interested in that, you just need to email me. Uh, my email address is at the bottom of the handouts. It's very simple. I've kept my AOL address, tgbandy at aol.com, because it's in all of my books and people know it. And uh, so that's the one that's most memorable. So if you'll, if you'll remind me, I can send you a, a toned down version of the PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. Great. 
So, um, so we'll just get started. Tom Bandy is uh, an internationally recognized consultant, conference speaker, leadership coach for Christian organizations and faith-based non nonprofits. He is president of Thriving Church Consulting. can be found in his virtual office. You'll see at the bottom of uh, the center discussion notes there, www.thrivingchurch.com. Uh, Tom is widely respected for his unique ability to understand diverse cultures, traditions, denominational politics, and his grasp of systematic change and congregational mission. Welcome, Tom, and thank you for this um, not first uh, time joining us on the uh, EDGE well, webinar class. series. It's good to be here. Thank Welcome. you. Welcome. Uh, greetings, everyone, and thank you for taking the time, in whatever time zone you're in, uh, to join this seminar. Um, uh, Rob has introduced me a little bit, and I just want to add that I am readily available by, uh, by email or by Skype or uh, by phone or other ways and would be glad to chat with people more personally about your situation and uh, the issues we're talking about today. Um, uh, I don't have an opportunity at the beginning of our seminar to get to know you very well, so I hope that during the breaks when we have a chance to ask some questions and talk, I hope you can feel free to share any particular facts about your context or your situation and as you frame questions, maybe I can be as specific as possible to, to help you, coach you through the issues you're facing. So I hope that will come. Uh, before we begin our uh, seminar, I would like to open in prayer. Um, that's part of my uh, core values and beliefs that uh, we'll talk about as we build consensus in a church. Uh, today, I would like to uh, just share with you and invite you to join me in prayer using the serenity prayer in full. So if you'll pray with me. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace. Taking this sinful world as Jesus did, as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will, so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. Amen. Uh, the serenity prayer Amen. in full, one of the most ancient prayers of the church. There are uh, two handouts that I hope that you will download and uh, have handy as we talk together. Uh, they are in the bottom left corner of your screen. Uh, I'll caution you that the one handout called Steps on the Journey is one page, but it is legal sized. And unfortunately, I can't put that on the screen to share with you. It, it does look like that. Uh, and it's kind of a road map that I'll be using as I talk uh, through the seminar today. And the other handout, uh, for you who can see it, looks like that at several pages. Get it in front of the webcam. And uh, that outline uh, also contains footnotes for other resources that you can use to follow up. Um, as I say, we will be taking some intentional breaks for questions as we go along. Uh, you can see the PowerPoint that I'm using, and so I'm just going to kind of get into it and begin to talk about mergers and more. Uh, when, we, when we come to the conversation about church mergers, uh, I have found that most uh, church leaders actually uh, start talking about it too late. I'll say a little bit more about the critical mass of a church and when you should begin thinking about options for your church. But I simply want to celebrate that you folks are here today and you have begun to identify an issue which is actually facing uh, as many as 80% of the churches of all brand names in Canada today. Uh, about 80% of the churches of all brand names really need to be starting to talk about alternative models for congregational mission in which mergers may be one alternative. Um, in, in the beginning of this conversation and at the end of this conversation, 
the theme we keep coming back to is all that matters is the gospel. Everything else is tactics. All that matters, you might say, is that people experience the transforming power of God and, and walk intentionally and daily with Christ. And everything else, you might say, the property, the personnel, the, the budgets, and so on, is, is tactical and therefore discussable and changeable. And that's really kind of the attitude with which people approach a conversation on merger. Uh, there are some resources I just want to call your attention to. These are mine. Uh, they are available through uh, Amazon.com uh, normally. The very last one called People Person is just coming out within the next month or so and you can look for it. I can say a word as we go along about them. Um, as you begin the conversation, the journey uh, about alternatives for congregational mission, there is a uh, there is a uh, context, there is a platform, an atmosphere. Uh, I'm not sure what the right metaphorical word is, but there is a way in which we raise the questions about merger and change. And that, that arena in which we raise it is always the atmosphere of trust, or we build the conversation on a foundation of trust. And the biggest reason why mergers fail today between churches, and the biggest reason why we can't even get very far in talking with people about radical change in our congregation, is that deep, deep inside, we don't really trust each other. We, we do not really hold one another accountable intentionally to a common consensus of core values, bedrock beliefs, motivating vision, and anticipated outcomes. This consensus is often missing in the small church, maybe a family church, it may be a family chapel, but we fail to have this consensus. And so I begin today by simply talking about what this consensus is and, and, and generally how you can begin to build because we can't get very far in the conversation unless we build this foundation of trust. Um, this is, in, in church growth terminology, uh, called genetic code for the body of Christ. Some people call it DNA for the body of Christ. Uh, it, uh, it is a DNA that is embedded in every worship service, in every budget line, in every program, in every volunteer leader, in every board member. It is the first thing uh, it is the very first thing that we talk about in any annual meeting. Uh, the annual meeting, uh, first and foremost, uh, defines, refines, and celebrates this consensus that we have about values, beliefs, vision, and mission. Uh, it, is, uh, it is what our pastors model and teach uh, in confirmation classes and in new members assimilation classes and in uh, training for official board positions. And it is the, the, the basic foundation through which we hold our leaders and our members accountable in the life of our church. Um, now this is often missing uh, in so many small churches and we cannot get very far talking about change unless we intentionally build and embed this DNA in the church. Very briefly, uh, what is a core value? Uh, a core value is not wishful thinking. It is not uh, simply an ideal, uh, but it is in fact a positive and predictable behavior pattern that we can count on among our members that they will reveal it uh, unthinkingly and spontaneously in their everyday life but also very daringly in their positions and their actions within the church. So a core value is a behavioral pattern, uh, a positive behavioral pattern, uh, akin to the fruits of the spirit, where people behave gently or lovingly or kindly or generously. And when we do not see that behavior, church people will readily hold one another accountable for it and, and remind us of it. Uh, we can test that behavior uh, as we begin a conversation about merger. 
uh, because we ought to be able to tell a, a paradigm story uh, about that would illustrate uh, a certain behavior pattern as normative and typical in our church. So if someone said, oh, uh, so you habitually behave gently and kindly in your church, then you ought to be able to tell very quickly a story from within the last nine months or year in your church of real people in your church. And you can say, well, there's an example of what we're talking about. And, and that kind of thing is repeated wherever our members go and however our members uh, behave. You'll always see that among our members. That's, that's a core value. Um, a bedrock belief is not a dogmatism. It is not a creedal statement. Uh, it is a, a deeply held conviction to which we know our people will automatically turn for strength in times of confusion or stress. So if there's a death in the family, if there's a, a tragic accident, if somebody's in the hospital going for surgery, if somebody's facing a crisis with their children or their marriage or their parents, there are certain scripture verses, there are certain uh, maybe hymn verses, there are certain ideas, there are certain faith convictions that people turn to. And, and this, this is automatic and a consensus within the life of our congregation. And many churches create a collage. It might even be a visual collage on the wall where through image and word and scripture and verse, they identify these various core convictions that people turn to for strength. And that is part of the foundation of trust in which we begin a conversation about, about merger. Um, I'll move on and finish this and then, and then pause a moment, see if you have any questions which you would put on your, um, on your uh, text message screen. If you have questions, go ahead and put them up there as I'm talking and we can quickly respond to them. Uh, I'll go on. A motivating vision. We have spent a lot of time in United Church congregations developing mission statements. And, uh, and forgive me, I don't want to uh, offend. I just want to be honest and say that uh, when I work with United Church congregations, most of the mission statements that were developed are generic, they are general, they are vague, they are programmatic, they are long, uh, they are forgettable, and they are useless when it comes to making serious, big strategic decisions about your church. So what is a vision for a church that really uh, empowers you to make tough decisions about the future? Well, a motivating vision uh, really is not even something you put in words. In fact, if you can say it in words, you probably miss the point. It's really a song or an image or a metaphor or a picture, the mere recollection of which elicits joy and demands to be shared with strangers. I, I sometimes call it a song in the heart. And in some United Churches I've been with, it is literally a song that they sing whenever they gather together or whenever the board meets. And it never fails to move people to tears and start the heart racing and, and feel a sense of urgency to sing it out or share it with other people. Um, somehow or other, that vision uh, needs to emerge from the prayer life and, and meditative life of a church. And it becomes front and center to align everything we do to the achievement or the pursuit of that vision and nothing else. It prevents us from sidetracking into personal agendas and helps us to keep focused on, I'll just say, what really, 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 really matters to us here. This is it. And uh, that, the, you know, that, that then can, can then translate into a consensus of what I would say would our anticipated outcomes. Uh, a church has two or three or four, not more, but, but these are measurable goals of discipleship, discipleship uh, with which we routinely measure our organizational success. In other words, at the end of the year, your board uh, needs to look at each other 
and ask and answer the question, were we successful this year? Well, how do you answer that? Now, now a lot of, a lot of uh, United Churches I'm with have never done an exercise to identify anticipated measurable results or outcomes. And so at the end of the year, they measure success uh, unreflectively, intuitively, without, without even kind of uh, saying it. But the truth is, the bottom line is that at the end of the year, they say, well, we're successful if, we, if, if the assets are increasing and we have a balanced budget, if the property is well maintained, if, if there are more uh, contributors and envelope holders, if the clergy feel secure in their job, if, if everybody thinks we do good worship, and if everybody's happy. See, if all that's there, we're successful. And I think all of you listening to me will probably say, yes, um, that often is the tacit assumption. And in order to begin uh, exploring radical changes, including mergers for our church, we need to begin by focusing much more intentionally on the real measurable goals uh, for our organizational success. Uh, now I'm going to pause a moment having said that. That's, there's a workshop uh, right there in about 10 minutes. Uh, and I see some questions may come up. Go ahead, Rob. Yeah. So Tom, oh, yeah, Heidi's got a question, but before that, even during the opening prayer, um, that uh, extended version is the first time I've heard that of the uh, Serenity Prayer. The part that talked about we're we're going to face the world as it really is, as opposed to how we wish it was. I don't remember the exact words, but that was the intent. And uh, it made me think of how many JNAC reports were really a statement of how people wished their congregation was, rather than actual. When you come to a merger, how how then can you be sure that the other person is even able to give you an accurate picture of who you're, the other congregation, I mean, oh, yes. uh, of and, who you're um, I will come back to this in a, a moment, but let me say this Are now. there ways of kind of an um, acid test? When uh, you begin to talk to, about uh, radical test change, perceptions. including merger, um, you, you need to uh, uh, very realistically, intentionally listen to the primary mission field surrounding your church. The United Church of Canada offers you a tool to do that now with an environics demographic study that allows you to identify in very great detail lifestyle groups, as they call them, or lifestyle segments, uh, and, and how they behave and what they're looking for and, and all kinds of information about that. Now, of course, you cannot just stop with the environics report. Um, there's no substitute for prayer walking, for listening prayer triads, for other vehicles to get your board, to get your church people intentionally listening and observing the, 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 the real publics. And I use the word plural, publics, because they're very different peoples around you in the church. And in a merger, of course, you're often expanding the primary mission field beyond the, the neighborhood or the block or the, or the postal code even in, in which you currently reside. And so our listening is, is broadened out. I'll try to say a little bit more about that, but um, I, did a, I did a webinar not too long ago with uh, the, the Edge on Environics and Demographic Material. Uh, for those of you in Hamilton Conference uh, in the fall, I'll be doing a workshop with Halton Presbytery's event called uh, Ministry in Motion on applications of demographic research and so that that that's one way of responding to your question yeah so Heidi has asked uh, the the question often um, we look at the closest neighbor um, as a natural merger uh, partner Heidi, congregations uh, could be across the street but they may have very different uh, let me first bedrock assume, values is merger possible uh, in, in that, that question situation? that you when you say neighbors you're referring to neighbor churches uh, there may be churches of of the same brand name or other denominations who are neighbors of you and uh, the answer to the question is, if you don't have a compatibility 
of shared values, beliefs, vision, and you know, vision and outcomes. If you don't have a kind of basic compatibility there, no merger is not possible for you. It doesn't make them a bad church or you a bad church. You're just too different. On the other hand, what we have found is that there are often compatibilities which cross over denominational boundaries. And so there are United Churches who have found great compatibility with uh, Anglican Church, uh, Baptist Church, Independent Church, Lutheran Church, and so on. Uh, and, but, but you've got to get beyond the denominational rhetoric to get down to the bedrock of the, of the identity in order to talk about the merger. Uh, now, you might have meant, Heidi, by neighbors, not churches, but just simply publics and people around you. And it, it is uh, sometimes true that a church's, the members' uh, identity of values and beliefs and, vi and vision may be different than the general public's. And that's, that's grist for the mill as you discuss the future mission outcomes uh, that you'll measure success by when, when you talk about a merger. But we'll, we'll maybe talk about that later. Um, great question, Cynthia. Um, and it does not so Cynthia just, have to be just kind of added and this is really the question significant in the postmodern uh, world. With other than um, in, or churches. say, shall we say, the post-Christendom world. In 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 this post-Christendom world, the primary uh, faith community today is not necessarily a church. It could be a parachurch. It could be a, a faith-based nonprofit. Uh, I work with churches in Australia, England, um, and uh, and different parts of of North America, which are really strange, like New Orleans and Newfoundland. But but um, you can even see there, uh, if you can imagine it, faith-based for profits, not just faith-based nonprofits. So there are actually a lot of entities that we can begin to build a conversation around cooperation, partnership, merger. However, uh, just as a caution, uh, Cynthia, uh, or Audrey, I guess it was Audrey asking, um, uh, all, almost all, in fact, I, I attempt to say all, uh, any of the faith-based nonprofits, parachurches, or faith-based for-profits with which I have ever worked are always a zillion times clearer about their core values, bedrock beliefs, motivating vision, and organizational outcomes than a church. And one of the reasons they're hesitant to merge with the church is because you're so unclear. So if you want to have that conversation, then this conversation of consensus is even more urgent. Okay, so uh, turns out Heidi's question was uh, were maybe more concrete than uh, than general. Aaron is um, so there are kind of two things here. David is asking, well, if if a full merger isn't on, can there be shared space if the values and can that be successful? Uh, to, just to rent uh, space rather than merger. Aaron is uh, kind of filling in background uh, to um, there, that she's in the congregation close to Heidi's, and there's some uh, commonality, well, first, three for bits David, of core values the um, same, for example, or is, it Jan is that enough? Speaking for David. Um, and uh, it, anyway, she realizes uh, you can't really answer the question. If you wouldn't mind holding on that question, <laughs> I'd like to talk that. about that a little later, and 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 we should move along in our, in our time together so I uh, can do it, that. Um, oh, and, right, uh, yes, Aaron, in response to your question, uh, it's true, it, it, there's never perfect compatibility you know, what, what is enough compatibility for a merger? Yeah. And there's no one, there really isn't any one rule about that. I would say, however, that there's often compatibility related to core values. That's not the difficulty. The bigger difficulty is compatibility around bedrock beliefs and overarching motivating vision. That is a bigger issue. And that is going to be resolved not just by uh, conversation, but by prayer partners. Um, what I've learned in this is that basically you have to think before you act, but you have to pray before you think. 
Uh, now, should we move on, Rob? Uh, I, uh, and, and keep on. Um, I, I'm shifting now uh, to um, say a word about critical mass. Uh, after we've explored this issue of yes. trust, let's carry on. Uh, I want to say something about uh, critical mass uh, uh, because I get a lot of questions about this when you bring up the question of alternative models for your church potentials of merger, people always ask, yeah, but, but couldn't we hang on, you know, couldn't we survive a little longer, you know, whatever. Well, this is what we're learning. As of today, if this is different than it was even 10 years ago, and in another five years, it'll probably be different again. But as of today, right now, um, uh, basically, the critical mass for a local church to maintain its independence and complete control over its program and support a full-time ordered ministry staff person. See, if you're trying to do that, maintain your independence, have full-time ordered ministry leadership, in order to do that, you do need to have about 125 active adults, 100 regular worshipers. 60% of those worshipers need to be very active in midweek small groups or Sunday schools. You need to have 100 to 200 new contacts in your database, whether visiting worship or outreach or small groups or whatever, every year. And you need to have in hand one major ongoing year-round signature outreach mission that blesses the public beyond your church in which a lot of your volunteers are active and you continually support it in prayer in every worship service. Uh, now, that's just a snapshot. I know it can vary from place to place and so on, uh, but this is mainly for mainstream churches, um, some evangelical churches and Catholic churches and Orthodox churches uh, can sustain a lower critical mass because they train tithing and, uh, and they encourage and require much more serious personal spiritual disciplines so they can have fewer active adults and worshipers and so on. But for, for those of folks in mainstream churches, that's a, that's a great measuring stick for critical mass. The problem is, is that when you use that measuring stick, 80% of the United Churches in Canada, and, and maybe more, are struggling to meet that critical mass. And today, um, unless you act soon to begin the conversation about alternatives, your your options will rapidly diminish in terms of what you actually can do. Um, now, um, uh, looking at the comments there, I, I'm not going to pause. I, I'm going to keep going to the next section. Again, I'm talking about preparation for the conversation about merger, the attitude you bring to it, um, assuming that you have built up a, a deeper sense of trust within your church so that you can even start to talk about this without having a fist fight on the front lawn or, or having somebody have a major heart attack. Um, well, here's the attitude. When you approach this conversation, you've got to put everything on the table. Nothing is held back. When you talk about what to do beyond critical mass, whether whether you're going to think about renting space or or, or, or merger or other kinds of options, what you have to say up front is that there are no sacred opinions, there are no sacred comfort zones, there are no sacred people, whether it's a matriarch or a patriarch or a clergy person. There are no sacred committees, there are no sacred properties, there are no sacred uh, technologies, there, you know, there's no sacred pews, there's no sacred stained glass, there's no sacred audio systems. And there are no sacred capital pools. There's no sacred memorial funds that are going to be held back. See, everything's got to be on the table. It's all there negotiable. The only thing that's not negotiable is your core values, beliefs, vision, and mission. That's why you built the consensus about it. You have to be able to say to your folks, we, we will stake everything on this conversation, but we will guarantee you that we will never sacrifice or compromise the, the values and the faith convictions and the motivational vision that is and defines who we really are. And based on that, 
you begin the conversation of compatibility with other churches. Um, just to, to uh, uh, prime the pump in terms of your conversation as it unfolds about merger, uh, right at the very beginning, people are going to be talking about how much will it cost? You know, what's the price tag when it comes to changing alternatives for our church? They always, always leap to talking about the price tag about money or property and sometimes about personnel. That's always where they leap. And right at the very beginning, I strongly say to you, you've got to tell people there are seven cost centers to change. That's true whether you're starting a new worship service, buying a new musical instrument, or merging a church. There are always seven cost centers. There's the cost in changing tradition, the cost in changing attitude, changing leadership, organization, then the cost in changing property, the cost in upgrading technology, and if a church is willing to pay the price of discipleship in the first six cost centers, the financial cost will never be a problem in North America. Other countries in the world, that's a problem. There are a few areas in Canada where that's a problem. But what I've seen again and again is if your church enters the conversation about merger, and they first of all address how they have to change their traditions, how they have to change the attitudes of people in their church toward other publics and lifestyles and so on. If they first address you know, the changes that have to come, not so much in staff leadership, but board leadership and lay leadership, the price in changing their organizational model, council, board, or whatever, uh, then they can talk about you know, relocations or new locations or, or whatever facilities, and they can talk about upgrading technologies. And if they're willing to pay that price and they know what the price is, the money will almost always be there. And I've seen that time and time again. So right away in the merger conversation, rein people in. Don't run off and start talking about property and technology and money. You've got to start at the beginning and talk about traditions, attitudes, leaderships, and organizational models. And then you'll talk about the rest in terms of mergers. Um, uh, there are certain principles about strategic planning that I am, uh, since our time marches on and I want to allow time for dialogue, uh, I, I won't go too far into this, but um, what I've found is... Uh, this is an important piece that needs to be raised by, by you folks who are leaders at the very beginning of conversations about change. What I found consulting with, with churches over and over again is that uh, so many churches I work with do not know the very basic principles of strategic planning. What we are used to doing is SWOT analyses. And you all know what SWOT means, S-O-W-T. You know, what we're used to in a lot of churches is having a big gab fest, you know, the congregational meeting, the workshop, the retreat, and we simply brainstorm strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. That's SWOT. And we think that's strategic planning, but it's not. That's just brainstorming. Serious strategic planning, which you've got to do if you're going to talk about radical change to your church like a merger, you've got to, you've got to embrace the three basic principles of strategic planning. And the three basic principles of strategic planning are the principle of the first cut, the principle of acceleration, and the principle of impact. Now, I'm just going to explain what those principles are and you'll want to explain those as you begin the conversation as people start to think about radical change and even merger. You know, here's the, here's the principle of, of what I call the first cut. You never do anything, you never plan anything without first knowing the answer to the following three questions. Why are we doing it? Who will lead it? And how will we measure the results? So that goes right back to the DNA stuff I started with today. Values, beliefs, vision, and mission. 
You don't want to even start the conversation about merger or radical change without, without asking the question, why are we doing this? What's the point? You know, And that goes right back to the visioning issue. And then you have to ask the question, who's going to lead this? Now, I, I do know there are some churches, God bless you, you're way beyond the critical mass. There, there are churches, to be honest, and the median age of members in the church is 85. Uh, and you, you may not you may not have a, a full-time minister or or it may just be a kind of a chaplain caretaker but to be honest you may not have the kind of people who are gifted and skilled to lead this conversation about merger and change and and you might want to, instead talking about merger you may begin to want to talk about visionary closure which I'll comment about later and then finally of course you know what will the results be this goes back to your organizational outcomes that I, I discussed at the beginning. In, in the end, you're going to have to ask and answer the question about merger. If you merge, you have to say, was, was this merger successful? And so you have to start with defining, how will we measure that? It is the only measurement of a successful merger that the number of people on the membership role have tripled? Is that, is that it? Or is that the money is more? Well, you and I probably know, no, those probably aren't the best way to evaluate mergers. There are better ways to evaluate mergers. And, uh, and, and you need to begin to define what those results will be. Well, that's the principle of the first cut. Uh, the second key principle of strategic planning is the principle of acceleration. Uh, basically, what this means is that whatever you decide to do strategically, it needs to accelerate, increase the, the number of members, participants, or people who are engaged, involved, and impacted by the life of your church. Now, I know this is church growth. This is internal. It's basically internal. This is all about, you know, if we're going to merge, we're doing it to increase the, the number of folks who are excited and active and participating in this faith-based community. Uh, now, alongside that is the principle of impact, and this is external. The one was internal, this is external. Alongside that is whatever you decide, it needs to increase the power and, and manner in which your church changes the world and your neighborhoods and your communities for the better. And social action, evangelism, new hope, faith, personal transformation, whatever that is, that's, that's the third principle. So no matter what you decide to do, you need to know why, who, and what result. And you need to have outcomes that measure internal growth and external impact. It's not either or, it's got to be both and when it comes to a church merger. And so those are the basic principles of strategic planning. And uh, in one of my books, Accelerate Your Church, there is a, there is a, a whole discussion of strategic planning. And there is a, a template that looks something like this uh, that hel helps you to kind of begin to measure. Uh, you'll notice over here um, to the far left, you know, is, is the first cut, you know, why, who, and what results. Then, you know, what are the key tactics of when and how and where we're going to do it. Here are the cost centers I identified, measured, and as you identify those, you can anticipate stress. So when you're talking about merger, um, if, if, you, if you're having a lot of stress talking about the cost of change to tradition and attitude, how do you overcome that stress? Well, you do it by emphasizing personal growth. You emphasize how people grow personally, spiritually, relationally, that, that might include helping them become sensitive to other microcultures and publics and races and, and, and you know, and, and uh, lifestyle segments in the, in the community and so on. If your stress level is mainly around leadership, you know, clergy and, and board leadership, well, you overcome that stress on the road to merger by talking about accountability and, and how our leaders are trained and evaluated and deployed. And if, if the stress you're anticipating is mainly around the cost to property change or technology change, 
uh, there you do the prayer walking and the and the environic studies to to make to elevate mission sensitivity because property and technology is all about relevance. And then finally, if if the stress you have is all about money, um, the real way to overcome that stress is not talking about fundraising per se, but about lifestyle adjustments. That's really the road to tithing. You know, the the road to increasing generosity. Is, is not to do a fundraising campaign and sell more pies and have a rummage sale. It's, it's to coach people about adjusting their lifestyles to spend less money and energy on themselves and more money and energy on others. That's, that's a lifestyle coaching approach. Again, I've, I've been quick and very brief, and I'll pause now to see if there are any quick questions. And then I do want to go straight on and I want to talk about step by step. How do you go about merger? So. Tom, while people that, are great, maybe thinking uh, about question, a, a question, and, and um, asked, uh, uh, folks, at a number of points, are, uh, we're talking uh, about uh, measures simple. and measuring um, different things there are three uh, than ways we maybe traditionally have. What are some of the measures congregations are using in the to, uh, three to help get a sense of growth and Three basic ways we measure anything. Whether technology. we're measuring the success of a small group, whether we're measuring the success of an outreach ministry or a worship service, or whether we're measuring the success of a merger. There are three ways. Here are the three ways. Statistics, storytelling, and feedback. So the first way we measure something is by counting something, statistics. The number of members, the number of worshipers, the number of small group participants, the, the, the amount of money. That's all stats. Now you and I know that there's a lot about the church that cannot be reduced very easily to statistics. So that's why we measure storytelling. Basic storytelling is we measure uh, how many and how significant and how profound are the stories people are telling about our church or our program or whatever it might be. And those stories get told, you know, to members and ministers and so on. And those need to be to be repeated, recorded, collated within the church, and we can count the stories. For example. I know United Churches that start a healing worship service, uh, and a year later, there's not a single story recorded of anybody being healed. So how successful is that? You know, if you, if you, and, and so you count stories, and stories is a way of counting quality. And then feedback is how you intentionally go out to your mission partners. They could be nonprofits, healthcare units, uh, mental health, uh, social services, uh, other churches, or so on, and you ask them and you get feedback from them whether your church or program or your vision as a church is on the radar screen and part of the buzz of the community. Are social service directors recommending you? Are they talking about you? And you can track that as well. So there are three ways, Rob, really, that we measure anything, no matter what your outcome might be. I don't see any questions on the text message. That either means that you're really bored or I should move on. So I'll, uh, I'll hope that it means you would like me to go on. Thank you. All right, I will. Um, okay, okay, great. I, I appreciate that. It's, it's, that's the trouble with webinars. You don't always know what other people are thinking. Um, uh, as I get into talking about the steps for mergers, you're getting some feedback there. Uh. Um, I want to talk more about uh, accountability uh, and uh, externally focused changes. Um, I won't say a lot about accountability. I, I just want to share with you that um, you will be uh, probably choosing. Uh, a vision team, some people call it a transition team, but you're probably going to be choosing a group of people 
with high respect and credibility in your church. They may be the same as your board. They may not be. Uh, the, the clergy or staff may be part of it, or they may not be. But you often delegate authority and responsibility to a team to begin to explore uh, the merger conversations. The question always asked is, who should be on that team? What, what is the accountability of the people who be on that team? Well, uh, accountability is always in four categories. It has to do with mission attitude, high integrity, skills and competencies, and teamwork. If, if you want to appoint some people to be on a transition team or, or a vision team to explore a radical change for your church, there are four criteria. Number one, you want somebody who has what I call the mission attitude. It's someone who gets the vision, the big motivating vision that's the consensus of your church who really understands and, and takes that to heart and who's all on fire about it. Number two, you want somebody with high integrity. What I mean is you need someone on the team who, who really gets and models the core values and bedrock beliefs of your church, who, who really is all on board and behind that who doesn't have radical faith doubts about many of your bedrock beliefs. You don't want somebody who regularly acts out or misbehaves in reference to the core values of your church. You want somebody on that so that in a, in a compatibility conversation with another church partner, if someone in that other church would say to you, eh, what's your church like? Well, you know, you could say to them, well, you just, you know, you, you see Ralph over there. You see Sally over there. She's on our team. If you just follow Sally around for 24 hours and overhear everything she says and watch everything she's done, she epitomizes our church. Her values, her beliefs, she is our church. That's kind of integrity you want on that team. Now, you also want skills and competencies. Uh, it's helpful to put on that team people who are forward thinkers, uh, creative thinkers. Uh, they may have some experience in their business or, or uh career backgrounds in interpreting demographic research uh, and that sort of thing. So you want them in the team. And then, of course, you, you want people on that team who are team players uh, and they're not uh, dictators or controllers. So I'll move on from that. That's, that's kind of who you want right now uh, on your team. And uh, now you're going to explore some, some uh, options. Uh, earlier, uh, someone asked about uh, renting space and other choices for uh, your uh, for your church. Um, there, there are other options uh, that you might consider as a church. Uh, these include, um, you, you, but because of your the age of your people or or how far in decline you are. The one option you might consider is a visionary closure. Uh, a visionary closure is a strategic uh, closure, termination of a congregation, but one in which you intentionally celebrate and give thanks for the, for the past uh, uh, experience of Christ and for the richness of ministry that you have accomplished through that church and then um, closure means that you intentionally hand off uh, the remaining members of the church to help them find a place in other faith communities. And then you uh, surrender the church and the church assets. Um, and you, you usually want to do that specifically to a judicatory presbytery conference. But, but what you want to urge is that that money will not be used simply to pay off debt or to manage overhead, but will be put into a fund for church planting or the birth of new church communities. That's, that's really visionary in, in terms of uh, allowing the, the life and faith of your church to live on. An, another option uh, many churches explore is reduced staff. Um, they go from full-time to part-time ministry, for example. Uh, and um, that, that often does carry you a little bit further down the road, uh, but I always caution people that um, almost, almost any church I've ever known that, uh, that tries to deal with decline by reducing staff, in the end, only postpones the inevitable for about five to ten years. Um, that, that 
church mergers really do need the presence of full-time ministry leadership. And once you've gone to part-time, there's just not enough energy and time available for it. A third option is Faith Campus. And earlier, uh, I forget who mentioned it to us, um, mentioned renting space, that sort of thing. Um, that's what I mean by Faith Campus. Faith Campus means that your church rents space to another church or nonprofit or something, or that you turn your assets over to some other faith and then you rent space from them. So that's, that's kind of the idea of a faith campus. Uh, the, uh, the challenge is, is the same in terms of, of compatibility of DNA. Um, the number one reason faith campuses fail is because there really isn't compatibility between the leaser and the renter. Uh, the, the participants on the campus really do not share the same values, beliefs, vision, and outcomes with each other. And, and eventually they just compete with each other and fight and it, and it collapses. Um, most faith campus initiatives uh, in the United Church of Canada or in Canada that I know, uh, it, it was a great strategy idea for the 80s. Uh, most of them have not panned out um, and have, have found other ways uh, to, to, to proceed. But many of them just did not pan out. Um, Many of them were based on pretty superficial ecumenical conversations that never really got down to core values, beliefs, vision, and mission. Um, the, the next set of options, uh, a lot of people today are talking about the circuit rider option. Uh, sometimes it's called clustering. Uh, even today, a lot of United Church pastoral charges are really circuit rider charges. Uh, circuit rider means the pastor, like the Methodist circuit rider, is riding his or her horse among all the different points. Um, there, are vari there are variations of this um, uh, in terms of uh, rotating worship and, uh, uh, and so on. But again, um, most circuit rider pastoral charge uh, options break down because the circuits are put together uh, by geographic convenience, not by compatibility of values, beliefs, vision, and mission. Uh, moreover, the circuit uh, maintains bureaucracy. There may be one circuit, but there are, there are three or four boards. Uh, three or, there are multitudes of committees. There's, there are several budgets. And the administrative overhead of the circuit is often just so overwhelming that it burns the pastor out. And it's one reason a lot of pastors are only there for three years, and then they move to a one-point charge. Um, the next option is mergers, which is really what we really want to focus on for the balance of our time together. Uh, there is an option for replanting. Some uh, very elderly churches, often urban churches, um, surrender their asset control completely to a young church plant. This is a totally different uh, kind of congregation, and so long as they can use the parlor to worship in, they, they allow another group to, to start a brand new congregation with another ethnic community or another, uh, another lifestyle segment entirely. But, but these are totally different entities, uh, and no one expects people from that new church to ever join the lingering church. Um, and, and Rob, I, I shouldn't really take time to go into it, but I could talk more. Uh, the top three, I'll say the top three, options really today in North America for small churches uh, are uh, becoming part of a megachurch franchise, uh, becoming a multi-site congregation, uh, or being way postmodern and being part of an ICC network. Uh, ICC in my language means intentional Christian community. Uh, these, these include house churches, neo-monastic communities, uh, but these are way out of the box uh, for the thinking of, to be honest, of many United Church established congregations. If you want to ask about those, I'd be glad to talk about them. But shall I, shall I, shall I move on to talk about steps and merger? Or God. Um, I got. I'm skipping over some slides here. Okay. 
uh, on page five, page five, where am I? No, page four of the one handout, top of the page says yeah, church mergers, so. uh, step one. We've got about a half an hour. Um, I'd like to walk through yeah. the steps on the journey. Uh, these are sort of chronological, although um, mergers are messy. All mergers are messy. They are, they are never tidy. So um, it's never quite chronological. You end up kind of going forwards and backwards a bit. But at least this kind of gives you a sense of the steps on the journey. And I'll try to give you a certain sense of timeline for this as well. Um, number one step on the journey is uh, what I call surrender to God's mission. Um, you as a congregation, uh, even before you begin conversations with potential compatible partners, uh, you review what I was just talking about, about building a consensus of trust, about the cost of discipleship, about the stake, about your overarching vision and message. And basically, uh, this, this becomes a prayer process, a, a congregational town meaning process, a small group process uh, in your church. And this may take you as much as nine months to do, just this step one. But, but this is a very, very important step to, to really get to the point where you're willing to stake everything you've got for the joy of surrendering to God's mission for your church, not the matriarch's mission for your church or the patriarch's mission for the church, not even the denominational mission for your church or the presbytery's advice for your church, but God's mission for your church. And these are the four critical questions on the screen that you could use for a small group conversation, Bible study, uh, table group conversation in a retreat or a workshop. Um, and uh, I, I discuss these questions in many of my books. Um, uh, when I was with the national office in the denomination back in the 90s, uh, I was quite well known and somewhat controversial for this first question, which I was raising everywhere. What is it about your experience with Christ this community cannot live without? Um, second question, uh, with our first breath and last penny, will it be God's mission or me first? Uh, this, this second question challenges the, 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 the fundamental deep down, often unarticulated, me first philosophy of churches, which, which honor membership privileges more than God's mission. And we've got to address that head on. Third question, can we give speakers, uh, uh, sorry, can we give seekers a good reason not to despair about the future? Uh, your, the future of your church does not depend on your policy for sexual orientation, and it does not depend on uh, your mission statement. It doesn't depend on your theology per se. Uh, it depends on hope. It depends on whether people in your community believe that you have a message of hope, that you can help them hope. Uh, and however you want to define it or get at it, uh, that's really the issue uh, to discuss. And the fourth question, it's the control issue. Can we let go control and allow others to use our assets to achieve God's purpose? Now, once you've dealt with those questions, you move on to step two. Uh, now, step two, Rob, is, is where we'll come back to, to the little, the, we had that earlier conversation about demographic research. Um, to me, at this point, it, it's really all about um, uh, accountability for Christian witness. In other words, the more you study your demography, the more you do your environics research, the more you do your prayer walking and learn about the publics around you, the question comes up, are we relevant to them? Um, can, we, can, can we hold ourselves accountable to God for having blessed those people in relevant ways? And the only way to, to know that is first you've got to listen to them. What are their questions? What are their issues? Who are those people? And, and are we really relevant to bless those people? Now, uh, we can also begin to think about how we've deployed our staff, and we can evaluate, you know, pastoral leadership, program leadership, support staff leadership. Uh, but, but I'll warn you all, in terms of merger conversation, 
among small churches, the, the biggest issue is not the deployment of paid personnel. Your biggest issue in terms of whether you can bring off a successful merger or not is not who the clergy person is or what the clergy person represents or what the clergy person says. They, they are important and influential, and I don't want to discount it. But of more importance is board credibility. The, the, what, what, what compatible conversations compare, what, what churches compare with each other in the end is not their clergy, but their boards. And the, and the failure of a merger depends not as much on the clergy's ability to cooperate as on the board's ability to cooperate. And, and um, board credibility depends, remember that slide I shared earlier, it depends on mission attitude, high integrity, skills, competencies, and teamwork. Uh, churches that have routinely filled their boards with time servers, matriarchs and patriarchs and controllers or representatives of factions uh, and do not routinely train and evaluate and hold their board leaders accountable to a mission attitude, to a standard of integrity, to have certain upgraded skills and the ability to work as a team, they will always struggle and almost always fail in a merger conversation. Board credibility is more important than personnel right now. And, and that's why I talked about it when you appoint a vision team. Um, I'm just looking kind of check the text. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, Tom, just uh, so much of what you're saying depends on and encourages congregations. Like it's it's wonderful uh, to take a hold of their spiritual practice more strongly and to deepen that. And yet, in the United Church, it's probably one of the weaker areas. Um, uh, well, I can for think of at least a, a couple of things so, to say. Um, as um, a, as the first a denomination one is, uh, well, and I'm going to come at it as a, in a, maybe as kind an of odd a way. First way into that for people uh, that first um, thing is you know to, maybe it's been a while. On how these kinds of demands or expectations and have been made of uh, people. How do, you, how do you kind of find a way now, into some of you, uh, uh, and, reclaiming and that have that personal essential involvement in other kind of businesses and nonprofits? Piece. Maybe you have members in the church who have done so. You often hear people in the church talking about running the church like a business or whatever, but. And when the conversation of mergers unfolds, you know, you'll hear that comment. But this is what I want to say, say Rob, trying to respond to your question. Um, a business, when, a, when businesses and nonprofits go about mergers, they are actually very much aware that, this is, that, that, that the compatibility and the conversation board to board, not staff to staff, is their key issue. And, and when you look at boards, uh, in a business or in a nonprofit today, whether you know whether they're thinking a merger or not. When, but when you look at how nonprofit and business boards are created today, it is absolutely astonishing how rigorous and intentional they are in selecting their board members and holding them accountable to a standard of, and it's the same standard. Here's the amazing thing uh, of of mission attitude. And they'll even use the language of mission attitude, as if they were a church. They are on a mission. And uh, high integrity. All these boards and nonprofits have, have gone through significant work building consensus around core values and bedrock beliefs. Spirituality as a conversation is one of the top conversations happening in, in business and nonprofit boardrooms today. And, and people like me are invited to go and speak to people like that because, ironically, there's a bigger spiritual accountability happening in businesses and nonprofits than even in many a local church. And, 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 and then, of course, we'll talk about skills and competencies and the ability to be a team player. 
Um, so that's one way of answering the question, is, is by saying uh, that a church doing a merger has to behave to the same standard as if they were a business or a nonprofit doing a merger. This isn't just a negotiation between two families about arranging the betrothal of their favorite son and daughter. I mean, that's, this is a different mm -hmm. conversation. Second way to, con to, to respond to your, to your question is um, one reason that mergers often take a long time to unfold is that we have to whip a board into shape, if I can say it that way, to be able to hold the conversation. You know, it's like we have to put them on a diet, we have to get them on a fitness regimen, and, and we have to teach them how to pray. And we have to start teaching them how to exercise spiritual habits that open themselves to God's mission. And uh, I admit, we in the United Church have been very, very lax about doing that sort of thing in board development over the last, well, it, well, it, it happened since 1965. When the United Church went to council models, we dropped out the mentoring of board members as spiritual leaders. I'll just leave it at that uh, and move on. Um, okay, so um, next step, step three. Um, now, now in step three, we begin the conversations with compatible partners. And that's where, um, I'm not sure who it was, Cynthia or, or, or Heidi or whoever, but we're, we're, we're going to look around us and we're going to look for churches yeah. or parachurches, faith-based communities Thanks, of some kind that we think may be compatible with our uh, DNA and which we think share our overarching vision and which we think uh, have board people who have the kind of uh, integrity and attitude that would talk with our board people, you know, leader to leader. And, and the conversation is usually leader to leader at this point. It's not two congregations having a potluck. It's, it's two boards or two teams that sit down and usually in a retreat setting, an intentionally structured setting, and the, 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 the conversation is structured and they first talk about their values and they talk about their beliefs and they talk about their vision and they talk about their organizational outcomes. And then they begin talking about, you know, how might we collaborate, cooperate and so on. That's the way into this conversation uh, and that timeline, you know, we've already spent nine months talking about surrender to God's mission and, and maybe building accountability for Christian witness and these conversations with compatible partners, they, they may go on for, you know, three months, six months um, as we continue to look for partners that, that we might uh, work with. And then once we have found a partner and, and our conversation begins to go deeper, um, and, but we feel that we're compatible, um, now in step four, we're going to explore together um, uh, the, 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 the next cost centers. Um, what, would, what would an effective location, an effective property, an effective facility, and an effective technology look like if we were to merge and work together? Remember now, we've already put everything on the table. Um, and, you know, we, uh, our property, our facilities, they're all on the table. No one, no one has held anything back. So everybody in this conversation is willing to sell, relocate, change, anything. That's all on the table. But what really informs this stage in the merger conversation is your demographic research. Now we're going to come back to your demographic research. Because the key word here is effective. And, and it's not effective to your current members. It's effective for the mission field for the mission to the public. See, that's the question. Uh, you got to admit it, folks. Most of your members in a merger are going to be dead or in a nursing home in another 10 years. Uh, a number of them may be younger, but they may have moved away for career. Uh, your future lies in your relevance to the publics, not how much you can honor the comfort zones of the members. And so the conversation about what would be an effective location, property, facility, technology uh, is constantly referencing 
uh, the demographic research which you are doing. And that's why for many mergers, what's effective, obviously, is everybody relocates to a central accessible property. What's effective is that whatever that property is, is developed with, with the symbol systems and with the technologies that are, are most useful for the public you're trying to reach. I mean, that's kind of where that conversation obviously, you know, obviously goes. Um, and that really is the, the fourth stage. Um, and, and I know, see, in most merger conversations, we have wanted to leap into step four without going through step one, two, and three. And usually that's why we never get very far in step, in step four. But if we've done it right, now in step four, we can begin to, um, uh, to, to answer these, these questions. Now, now, now then in step five, this is where some of the denominational language and polity conversations begin to enter in. And, and, I, and notice now again, this is step five. Mm -hmm. uh, too many times we've rushed that. We, we started to compare Anglicans and United and, and Lutherans and Baptists way too early in the game. But, but, but once we've talked about you know, the property, location, technology issues, inevitably we will be driven to talk about polities and governance and uh, administration. Um, uh, I have my own book on this subject is called Spirited Leadership, Empowering People to Do What Matters. Um, there are not a lot, to be honest, there are not a lot of organizational books out there today um, on uh, uh, administrative guidelines for emerging churches. Rob, this is a workshop I'd like to do a webinar on with you at some point. Um, because most United Church leaders today, to be honest, uh, in order to get some of this information, they're traveling to the states, and they are particularly learning from policy governance uh, theorists like John and John Carver and Miriam Mayhew Carver. Uh, Miriam Mayhew, by the way, uh, being a Torontonian, uh, who was a, a pioneer in the early uh, AIDS hospice ministries in Toronto. Anyway. Mm. Um, Sounds good. Uh, in, in policy governance, what we need to learn is how to do boundary thinking. Um, and that uh, policy governance is all about defining boundaries with, beyond which you cannot go, but within which leaders have authority to do whatever works. Uh, it is the, it is the non-hierarchical, team-based models that are working best in effective organizations today. Churches are very unfamiliar with them. But when you're doing a merger the tendency is to build too much bureaucracy because you're trying to honor several denominational polities. And most denominational polities are actually very open to different governance models, like the United Church of Canada Manual is actually extraordinarily open, but churches don't take advantage of it because they don't know how. Um, so it's at this stage that we will begin to revisit administrative guidelines, policy governance, and the, the, the governance board or the organizational model of the emerging entity. Okay? Um, I'm, I'm just chugging along here. Um, yep. Well, um, I, I have known that to happen. There, there are some times when a so, small Tom, church uh, um, just goes uh, through looking the first at steps, uh, Cynthia's question and really there, what it becomes is a revitalization uh, She's process. saying that looking at steps uh, one, two, and three, you know, with that emphasis um, on on the other spirituality, hand, that happens would, less have now. You, uh, had as the experience we of congregations the discovering the that they actually don't need to merge once they actually start. Um, Being the American environment like is, is lagging behind in this. It's not quite there yet. The Canadian environment is much more hostile to organized religion and to churches than it was 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Uh, the American environment, or at least most right. American environments, 
are are more accepting and respectful of organization of, of religious organizations. But but in Canada, because of the growing hostility, you might say, toward any kind of organized religion, and that's church or mosque or or uh, synagogue. Um, it, it, it means that the issues of critical mass for a church and being able to sustain a ministry uh, are, are just hot, bigger struggles. They're, they're just more hurdles. And so it's harder to, it's, if you're a small church, it's a little harder to dig yourself out of the hole of revitalizing your church and achieving critical mass. And, and so you still may find that today, you know, you are revitalized and you are more excited and you are renewed spiritually as a church, but you are still going to look for a compatible partner in a merger. Now, Cynthia's question actually talked about physical move. And, um, uh, and I'll just comment that um, I, I don't know your context, Cynthia, of course, but... Um, Seven times out of ten, merger means relocation for everybody. Now, one reason for that is you've got to divest yourself of all the sacred cows in order to start fresh. Um, but the bigger issue, mm. to be honest, beyond that is the church growth strategy that the United Church used in the 60s and the 70s uh, is dated and was designed for a Christendom world uh, and a post and a, and a modern world. It, was, it basically our planting our growth strategy in the 70s and 80s was a neighborhood strategy, not a regional strategy. Which is why many of the churches we began in those days are tucked away on cul-de-sacs or down neighborhoods. They are not at major intersections or crossroads. They are not at uh, high, uh, highway interchanges or at the edge of town or see so they're not located for a regional ministry and the merger almost always implies a regional ministry and that almost leads almost always leads to a relocation I'll carry on um, Cynthia asked neighborhood versus what and I'm not sure what you mean by that so text me again and I'll come back so um, uh, now the next stage, uh, step six is about um, uh, implementation. And the key to implementation is delegating authority. You cannot do this by consensus meetings with a congregation. Uh, you have to delegate responsibility and authority to a team, good. and they will begin to implement uh, the, the transitional process. And of course, they will implement things that celebrate the past, and, and they will often relocate congregations to a temporary environment or rental space to help divest to sacred cows. And then after that wilderness wandering, wandering uh, during that time, they will choose a new name for the merged church. And the new name will almost always reveal the vision that's shared, not the past histories or locations. So skip all those long hyphenated names and the new, the new name is something like New Hope Church or, or God's Blessing on You Church or you know, something like that. Maybe it's the name of a saint who's particularly precious to everybody, but it is not, it is not the merger of Pine Street and Spruce Street churches uh, like we tend to do. Um, now you're going to merge all of the assets of the church. You'll make decisions about personnel and, and staffing and program mm -hmm. emphases. And then there's usually uh, a big celebration, um, sometimes tied with the new facility. And you birth the new church, the new name, the new board, the new structure, and you never look back. And you kind of enter the, you know, the, the promised land. That's roughly the implementation. The implementation, folks, is the easiest part. <laughs> I mean, it sounds like it's hard, but if you've done the rest, this is easy. This, this comes along. This is this works fairly effectively, and you can transition this in the space of just a couple of months. Um, so so far, in terms of timeline, um, to really do an effective merger, uh, it really often takes two to three years. 
And I know a lot of people out there say, yeah, but I, we don't have two or three years. Well, that's the problem. The, the critical mass has gotten too low. Uh, you can do it faster. You can try to do it faster, but there's more stress. Uh, great mergers often unfold among mainstream established churches, and they, they will take two and three years, but usually no more. And that time passes remarkably quickly um, when, you're fo when you follow this down the road. Um, I want to say a word uh, at the end of this seminar about, you know, my kind of top 10 list, top 10, you know, reasons for successful mergers and the top 10 pitfalls of failed mergers. And that's kind of how I wanted to end. I've only got about, uh, what, eight minutes, 10 minutes, Ron? Eight minutes. Um, so uh, let me briefly pause and see if there's a question, and then I'll just do that final piece. Well, uh, that's where um, uh, I, I would come back to the uh, criteria. Um, Eight minutes, yep. Uh, of of uh, um, critical mass. Um, there is a way leaders, uh, when a so church is Heidi in denial. Was, uh, asking a question up, there about uh, there is a way of visionary of closure versus how do you know um, when it's lot, uh, possible to go on or whether you really need to uh, close down. And there's a process over a period of six months when you when you let you know you sit down with your board and you lay down a fleece. And basically, this is you know it's a reference to Gideon's story and so on. But here's how it happened. Basically, um, pastor and leaders board. Um, say to themselves, uh, within, uh, within a specific timeline, and it's usually six months, sometimes nine months, but within the following six to nine months, we need to see the following things happen, the following measurable outcomes happen in the next nine mm -hmm. months, and if we do not see these things happen, then we do not all, any longer believe it is possible to ever regain critical mass on our own. So, you know, what do you lay down on the fleece? In the next six months, we need to see, and it varies from church to church, but, it, you know, let's say we need to see uh, at least, and I'm just picking some numbers here, we need to see at least uh, 50 new visitors come to worship from the general public who are not relatives of our current members. And if we saw 50 people in the next bit visit our worship service, that's a sign that we have hope and we can get back to critical mass. Um, second, they'll say, they'll lay it on the fleece and they'll say, if we, if we see every board member commit themselves personally to a spiritual discipline of daily and weekly habits of prayer, Bible reading, worship attendance, and conversation with the public about God, and they spend at least three hours a week doing it, for the next six months, and every board member does it, then we will have hope that we can regain critical mass. Uh, how about this, laying it down on the fleece? Uh, we know we will have hope if within six months, 80% of our members, both active and inactive, will have participated in some spiritual growth, small group, midweek, prayer group, Bible group, uh, conversation group, theology group, I don't care, but 80% of our members, inactive and active, will have committed to a small group with at least three sessions in the next six months. And if they do that, we will have hope that we can regain critical mass. You see what I'm doing? I'm kind of using critical mass as a, as a guideline, as a goal. And I'm, I'm laying down the fleece with people. And we've got to have a reason to hope. Not just wishful thinking, but a reason to hope. And the reason to hope is A, B, C, D, E, achieving these outcomes. And that's kind of formed by your board and by your minister. And you lay it out there. You lay it on, people. It's the, it's the fleece. And at the end of that period, then you have a retreat. And you'll, you'll ask yourself, did we do it? Did we make it? Um, now, if you do that, it will raise the stress level of people in your church. 
it will force you to think tactically because people will say, my God, how are we ever going to get 50 to 100 visitors who aren't relatives of the church to come in the next six months? Answer, change your music. Uh, change your preaching style. Uh, change your liturgy. Worship outside. I mean, it, it, these just become tactical things, you know, of, of how we're going to do this. And not, the, the stress level will, will go up and up and up. So, you know, but but you're, you're not going to face the truth. You can't break people out of denial without stress. I'll, I'll just pause there. Shall we go on then to the top ten list to finish things out? Um, and I'll try to be quick and, and just, you know, not go through it all. Uh, and um, we'll probably have time, maybe, Rob, for one, two questions. And then anyone with follow-up questions, um, I hope you all know, again, you're, you're very free to email me. You have my email address. Just tell me who you are uh, and where, you know, where we talked, where we met. Uh, and, and feel free to ask. Uh, I also do Skype conversations. Um, and lately, I do a great deal of Skype coaching. Um, I do them in six-month covenants, uh, coaching with pastors uh, usually once a month. Uh, it's on my website, and I can give you more details about that. But long-distance coaching is one of the emerging trends today instead of consulting, and I do a great deal of that uh, internationally, um, U.S., Canada, Australia, and uh, Europe. So let me know if you have interest in all that. So top ten list. Top ten keys to successful mergers. Uh, number one, uh, I feel like David Letterman. Uh, God's mission, the top ten key is God's mission always wins. That the, the end is a single new community goes deeper and further with Christ. Uh, number two, uh, top ten key is that everybody's on board. Everyone's united, not necessarily about tactics or theologies, but they're all united because they share the same DNA in, a, in every member, leader, and budget. That consensus about values, beliefs, vision, and mission. Number three, uh, top ten to key to a successful merger. Um, what happened to, <laughs> I guess I duplicated myself. No? All right, I'll keep going. Um, uh, team leadership. Uh, that in a successful merger, the staff uh, are more outwardly focused than inwardly focused, and they are deployed to make disciples and do leadership development, not just manage programs or visit, 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 visit until they drop of a heart attack. Um, my numbering is really uh, off on this. Uh, what, 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 uh, uh, what was missed in there, I see it on my printed handout, mission drives worship, wish I'd put it on there, it's a very important one. Um, top 10 key to a successful merger is that uh, worship is a function of mission, uh, and the best way to praise God is by participating in God's mission to redeem the world and bless the public. Uh, this is contrary to much of what we learned, but it is a key to a successful merger. Mission drives worship. Uh, then measure productivity, uh, um, not just process. Uh, the goal is uh, actual outcomes of mission, not just whether or not everybody's happy. Uh, number six, key to a successful merger, form follows function. Um, uh, space and technologies are only good when they facilitate spiritual growth and mission acceleration. Uh, you don't start with properties and work backwards. You start with vision and then leadership and then program, and then you design properties, facilities, and, pro, and, uh, and technologies to make them effective. Um, number seven, uh, you always build your church around a major, single, signature outreach ministry that is ongoing, prayed about constantly, and involves uh, at least 20% of your church members in hands-on volunteering. Um, number eight, key to successful merger is you maximize contemporary technologies, including uh, shuttle buses to carry people to and from, long distance learning through interactive websites, and contemporary forms of communication, including video screens in worship. 
Uh, top number nine, a uh, key to successful merger is uh, regular, rigorous evaluation that holds leaders accountable for attitude, integrity, skills, and teamwork. And the number 10 key to a successful merger is that when you eventually vote for it, you vote for a vision, not a, not a merger. You never ask people to vote to merge. Right. You ask people to vote for a vision. And the, tr and, the, and the tactic to get there is a merger. But you're voting for the vision. <laughs> now, Rob, um, I know my time's up. I didn't go through the top 10 list of pitfalls of failed mergers, and, and now it's actually a top 12 list. But I think you get the idea. Uh, I don't have to run through those, and why should I? That's such a downer at the end of our conversation. Um, let me just rather end by saying you can do it. Um, there, there, are many, there are many churches that fail to do it, but there are also churches that do it. There are successful churches that do it. Uh, a number of years ago, I led a successful merger of four. These were Baptist churches in the city of Windsor, Ontario. Uh, I've known of churches merging in outports of Newfoundland. I've known them merging in remote and rural areas. Uh, often urban areas are harder than, than the rural areas. Uh, but, but merging small town churches can be some of the hardest. But, but there are examples and there are, there are churches that have done it. Uh, and and they, some of them are within the United Church of Canada also. Um, I imagine, Rob, you can help point to some of those churches from your experience. M mine has been dated from when I was in leadership with the United Church National Office, um, and, but I'm aware of, of them also. Um, it is possible, and uh, no matter how old or small your church is, you can be part of a bigger vision of God that both accelerate, accelerates uh, participants in the Christian life through your church and tradition and uh, makes a positive change, social change uh, in your region. So uh, my hope is this has been helpful for you to pray about it and think about it and eventually act upon it. Thank and, you, Tom. It's uh, been a it's rich been a offering. And uh, thank you to thank those you of you who have engaged time, uh, as well in the conversation and been a part of this. this. Uh, Cynthia, I wasn't just sure links would be helpful to use as case studies. Was there something there we might be able to provide? Or were you pointing to the links already on the discussion notes? You want some success stories? Um, may want to look. Uh, uh, the, the story that always comes to mind for me, it's not that recent uh, is first uh, metropolitan in Victoria um, and very clearly the when the vision of um, a kind of cathedral ministry that can offer significant education to the community came about the the living out of that in uh, Epiphany Explorations which is really the largest United Church event um, uh, every year uh, and offered by one single congregation. About 800 people attend often in the middle of uh, the winter there. Uh, another example, uh, Central United in Moncton. This is a situation where a partnership with some congregations fell apart really because of the failure to, uh, to have real consensus on a vision. And um, uh, found some community partners, six community partners that uh, actually did have coherence in the vision and uh, four and a half million dollars of government funding later and some land thrown in by the city as the congregation and these six agencies are now the Moncton Peace Center. A great story. If you just Google Moncton Peace Center, you'll get uh, some more of the story on that. Anyway, thanks so much, Tom. Excellent. And... Um, uh, tomorrow night, uh, webinar with Ched Myers and uh, others on our website. So do uh, uh, keep watch for the offerings. Thanks again.